Good afternoon uh, and uh, welcome to the Institute of Business Ethics annual Hugh K lecture. Uh, my name is Ian Peters. I'm the director uh, of the uh, Institute of Business Ethics and uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you and to welcome uh, our guest speaker uh, this afternoon uh, who is Baron Evans of Weirdale, Jonathan Evans, uh, who is the chairman of the uh, Committee on Standards uh, in Public Life uh, and former uh, Director General of uh, MI5. Um, so uh, um, uh, in a few minutes, uh, we'll just hand over formally, introduce uh, Lord Evans and, uh, uh, and our chairman will take over for the rest of this uh, event and David Grayson who is the IBE chairman and is chairing the event as well um, will uh, will take up the reins and um, just a few uh, introductory words uh, from me to kick us off um, uh, some people ask what is the Hugh K lecture or even uh, who is or who was Hugh K um, and uh, it, a lot of people don't know this um, and when I took over here at the IBE I had to learn all these interesting facts of course um, the IBE was actually founded in 1986 by the Christian Association of Business Executives. Uh, and um, the first director uh, of that uh, body, um, of the Christian Association of Business Executives, was in fact a broadcaster and journalist by the name of Hugh Kay. Um, uh, he was quite well known um, and uh, used, to be a, used to be a regular contributor to uh, Radio 4's Thought for the Day. Um, uh, following Hugh Kay's death, um, the uh, Christian Association uh, of Business Executives, CABE, established the Hugh Kay Lecture in his memory. And when CABE uh, was dissolved a few years ago, um, they handed over uh, the lecture to the IBE to continue. So we continue that tradition. Uh, we've had some great speakers uh, in the past, uh, people, uh, leaders in business, for example, like Sir Stuart Hampson, um, Sir Mark Moody Stewart, Lord Green, and our own uh, Sir Tim Melville Ross. Uh, so we're very uh, pleased um, to have uh, Lord Evans with us today. Now, finally, just before I hand over to David, a few housekeeping or technical points um, for your information. Um, if you have a technical issue uh, and you need to contact uh, one of our uh, experts, then please use the raise hand function um, on GoTo uh, and then type your question uh, in the questions box and our events team uh, who will be keeping an eye on that box uh, will get back to you. Um, secondly, for questions to Lord Evans, again, please use the questions box, type your question in. We'll be keeping an eye on those and we'll make sure uh, that we cover as many as possible uh, in the uh, discussion uh, following uh, Lord Evans' uh, presentation, following his lecture. Um, also, just to let you know, we are recording the webinar and uh, the webinar will be made available to all of those of you who are registered um whether you're able to join us or not of course you won't be hearing this if you haven't joined us but um uh, you'll be able to to see it uh, or see it and hear it um and of course we'll make it available on our website and through the usual channels such as youtube etc uh, following the event and we'll be tweeting as well um you know nobody's immune to social media neither are we so uh tweeting will be going on through the event uh, so do please, those of you that are into twi Twitter and other such forms of communication, uh, joining the conversation with the hashtag, hashtag Nolan Principles. Make sure you spell principles correctly, otherwise it won't work. Uh, and with that, I will hand over to David Grayson, um, who will uh, uh, be chairing this event. Thank you very much. Ian, thank you very much. And can I add my welcome to what is an important part of the IBE calendar. This is actually the 30th anniversary of the UK lecture, and it's been given in some incredibly auspicious places, including Lambeth Palace and St Paul's Cathedral. And this evening we've gone even higher because we've gone into the cloud uh, to hear from uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Evans, who, as you've heard, um, has had a very distinguished public career in intelligence, in uh, counterintelligence, um, dealing with, with counterespionage and, and cyber terrorism and, 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 and so on. 
um, and uh, for a number of years was on the board of HSBC uh, and is also now chairing the, the public interest company, uh, public interest committee rather, of, uh, of KPMG. Um, but it's in his role tonight as the chairman of the committee on standards in public life that we're particularly delighted to hear him talking about whether we are indeed in a post Nolan world. If you've read your Times this morning uh, or were listening to the BBC Radio 4 World at One, you will have heard him already talking about some of the points that we're going to be hearing from him uh, this evening. But without more ado, I'd like to hand over to Jonathan to give the 2020 UK lecture and answer the question, are we in a post Nolan era? Jonathan. Well, David, thank you very much indeed. And I'd just like to say that I'm very pleased to be doing this uh, lecture, partly because of the fruitful and long established relationship between my committee, the Committee on Standards in Public Life, and the Institute of Business Ethics, because although in different spheres, we have a lot of uh, interests in common, and it's been a very fruitful relationship from our point of view. So my, my subject today is standards in public life. Are we in a post Nolan age? And in recent months, uh, we have heard a new phrase used by academics, commentators, and members of the public who have an interest in public standards issues. And that phrase is a post Nolan age. Similar sentiments appear in messages received by my committee uh, over the, the past few months in our public mailbox. And I want to quote a couple. Firstly, quote, I feel a great sadness that the moral framework which has guided British public life for the past quarter century appears to be well and truly over, said one email. And another, I'm not a member of any political party, but very concerned at the erosion of democracy and honesty. I fear for my children and their children having to live with the consequences of the lack of public accountability. These members of the public are concerned by the perception that those in public life no longer feel obliged to follow the so-called Nolan principles of selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership, otherwise known as the seven principles of public life. These principles have long underpinned the spirit of public service in this country and were first formally articulated in Lord Nolan's seminal 1995 report the first report from the Committee on Standards in Public Life, of which I now am chairman. In this lecture, I would like to talk about why the Nolan principles are still relevant, indeed critical for the health of our public life, both for those in public office and others who run businesses, why we need effective arrangements to underpin these principles, why some feel that those arrangements are under pressure, and what can be done about it. Since 1995, it's been increasingly accepted that anyone in public service should act in accordance with the seven principles. The principles apply to ministers and MPs, all civil servants, local government officials, public bodies, the National Health Service, agencies, as well as private companies and charities delivering services on behalf of the taxpayer. To a sceptical eye, the principles may appear to be little more than a list of moral generalities that serve no practical purpose. But this is to miss the scale and scope of their impact. These principles are not a rule book. They are a guide to institutional administration and personal conduct and are given a hard edge when they inform law, policy, procedure and codes of conduct. At their essence, the seven principles are there to govern the legitimate use of entrusted power in public life. All those of us in public life, whether through democratic election or public appointment, have some degree of power afforded to us on behalf of the public, whether it's the power to make decisions on benefits, to spend money in schools, to legislate to protect public health or to influence debate. This power is lent to us to be used for the good of the public. This is where the principles take effect. It is a norm in UK democracy that, for example, we expect office holders to use public funds for the common good and not to enrich themselves or their families. We expect elected representatives to work 
for their own vision of the common good, rather than acting for their own personal advantage. And we take for granted that there should be fairness in decision-making processes in areas such as policy, planning and procurement that will shape our future. Imagine a democracy without ethical standards, a political system where there are free elections, but where those elected make decisions solely in the interests of their supporters or paymasters, where public funds are systematically divert, diverted to private purses or where policy is sold to the highest bidder. Such a corrupt system is not democracy in any real sense. Democracy means more than just an elected dictatorship. To be elected or appointed or to, and to receive a publicly funded salary may place an individual in public office, but fulfilling the requirements of that office means recognising and upholding the ethical requirements that underpin it. The seven principles, tested regularly through research over the last 25 years, outline this implicit contract between those that govern and the governed, settling the terms for the acceptable exercise of power. And at no other time in our post-war history has this contract been more important when our government is asking the citizens to live with major restrictions and changes to their daily lives. Elections and institutions give us a constitutional framework, but the seven principles of public life define the character of our political system. Lord Nolan's principles remain an essential and remain as essential to the functioning of our democracy now as they did 25 years ago. They articulate a long-standing model of public life in this country. At the time of Lord Nolan's report, business had just begun to work in the public sector. Public service delivery models have moved on since then. And even before this pandemic, the government spent around a third of the pu of public expenditure, over £280 billion a year, on goods and services provided by private companies. Today, in many areas, private companies deliver public services directly. And so in 2013, the government made clear that any organisation delivering services on behalf of the taxpayer is also subject to the seven principles of public life. Outsourcing services like healthcare, prisons, transport, education does not mean outsourcing this ethical contract with the public. It does not mean that the Nolan principles are set aside. Our own research with the public on this issue came back with a really clear message. They didn't particularly care whether it was the public or private sector providing the service, what they wanted was common standards. The committee has reported twice on public service providers in recent years. We recognise that the application of public sector norms to private sector companies is not without its difficulties. Where does the obligation to the public good sit against a company's legal obligation to its shareholders? Where does the principle of selflessness fit in? Nevertheless, business leaders increasingly recognise that they have responsibilities that go beyond mere shareholder value alone. Public standards and business ethics are rarely, if ever, in conflict. Both form the basis of sound decision-making and good corporate governance. Governments and businesses that, are, that assess evidence objectively, that make decisions on the basis of long-term goals, and those that are not swayed by the temptation of personal advantage at the expense of collective gain are more likely to succeed in the longer term than those who do not. Our reports pressed government to do more to clarify and demand high standards of conduct for businesses operating in the public sector and set out how businesses aiming to supply government could demonstrate that they're living up to those standards. High profile contract failures and the subsequent impact on the public continue to make the case for shared ethical standards. And as government demands these standards from business, business should also ask the same of government. High standards are mutually beneficial. Public standards make the UK a more attractive commercial environment where the seven principles under, underpin proper process and procedure, government decisions are predictable and trustworthy. 
businesses can plan long-term investment in the knowledge that government decision-making rests on sound ethical foundations and can, if necessary, be challenged in strong and independent courts, an issue of central importance in my view. Low public standards should therefore be as worrying to business as they are to my committee. I noted with interest very recently, and this adds weight to the post-Nolan argument, that Moody's downgraded the UK's credit rating uh, in part due to, quote, the weakening in the UK's institutions and governance. So what are the structures and institutions that constitute the British standards regime? The Guardian's breaking of the cash for questions scandal prompted then Prime Minister Sir John Major to ask Lord Nolan to examine the arrangements that govern standards of propriety in public life. Nolan concluded that although a vast majority of those in public life and public office were of exemplary moral standing, it was not enough to rely on personal character and that procedures for enforcing standards needed strengthening. And so began what professors David Hine and Julian Peel have called, quote, the long march of the Committee of Standards in Public Life. Over the last 25 years, the following regulatory mechanisms have been established and evolved. The House of Commons and House of Lords Commissioners for Standards to set and oversee published codes of conduct. A ministerial code owned and published by the Prime Minister, supported by the Independent Advisor on Ministerial Interests. The Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, which separated expenses from the House authorities to support MPs and protect the taxpayer. The Electoral Commission, which ensures the fairness of our elections and aspects of whose work are currently being reviewed by my committee. An independent Commissioner of Public Appointments to ensure that ministerial appointments into public boards are made fairly and on the basis of merit rather than patronage. And finally, a statutory civil service commission to regulate appointments and act as an appeal mechanism for civil servants who want to raise concerns against the civil service code. And a number of significant reforms have been made to address lobbying and improve standards in local government, accompanied by a necessary revolution in the transparency of party funding, ministers' appointments on leaving office, and MPs' expenses and second jobs. Cumulatively, there's no doubt that Hein and Peel were correct to call these changes a profound transformation of the landscape of British government over the last 25 years. I would also like to recognise the role of the free media in all this. While there may be concerns about some ex excesses, their role in uncovering and highlighting standards issues is vital for scrutiny and helping to ensure ethical conduct. I can recall myself when I first became head of MI5, a wise colleague giving me advice not to do anything I'd be embarrassed to see in the Sunday papers. A free media is a useful safeguard. But if the process of institutional innovation has succeeded in implementing Lord Nolan's vision, why are there voices today who worry that we're living in a post-Nolan world? It was a renowned business theorist, Peter Drucker, who coined the famous aphorism that culture eats strategy for breakfast. The business world has long been aware that in organizations, behavior is shaped by culture uh, at least as much as by codified structure or by policy. Lord Nolan would have agreed. His wise report advocated greater education about standards, recognizing that though formal regulation was essential, high public standards were ultimately a question of organizational culture and critically of personal responsibility. Culture is not easy to define. On a personal note, over the last seven or eight years since I've been working largely in the private sector, I've lost count of the number of meetings I have sat through which discussed culture programs and their complexities. But we can recognize culture when we see it. High ethical principles will be integrated into every day decision-making processes. Innovation will seek to translate the principles into new contexts rather than leaving them behind. 
there will be adherence to norms, procedures, and processes of good governance with trusted outcomes. And of course, visible ethical leadership. The right tone from the top is an essential element of any culture transformation. The post Nolan accusation is that our public culture is changing for the worse. Quite simply, the perception is taking root that too many in public life, including some in our political leadership, are choosing to disregard the norms of ethics and propriety that have explicitly governed public life for the last 25 years. And that, when contraventions of ethical standards occur, nothing happens. But if someone acts in ways that break the rules or violates the principles, they should be answerable for their conduct. Many are questioning if this is still the case today. In fact, the Nolan principles are there in part to underline that those in office have ethical responsibilities which they should comply with, even if they can get away with it and not do so. Doing the right thing, even if no one is watching. However, the nature of partisan parliamentary politics can mean that the issue becomes not whether someone acted correctly, uh, but whether there was a or not, but whether there was a political will to deal with it. It would be remiss at this stage not to mention, as again Lord Nolan noted 25 years ago, the commitment of the vast majority of public servants to the highest standards of conduct. Our public sector culture is a positive one. This pandemic has caused some concerns but it has also demonstrated the overwhelming dedication of our nurses, our doctors, police, local government, officials, civil servants and MPs to a public service ethos, often under intense stress and strain. And I would add that many in the private sector have showed similar dedication. And having taken a step back, it's unrealistic to think that there has never been a scandal free, that there has ever been a scandal free golden age of British politics. Winston Churchill's financial arrangements as a member of parliament would today raise many questions. Cash for questions and sleaze dominated in the 1990s. Party funding and expenses were the standards issues of the noughties and lobbying concerns in the 2010s. Governments of all stripes have faced accusations that they are bending the rules to their advantage. Research carried out by my committee from 2002 to 2014 revealed that the British public perceived standards in public life as low and declining. But then again, research in the 1940s found the same thing. The post Nolan analysis also ignores that some of the, some of the considerable successes of the last 25 years. The principles are embedded in most public sector institutions and there are now well-established regulators able to consider standards issues in a particular context. MPs' expenses are now transparent. Parliamentary commissioners of standards in the Commons and the Lords have considerable powers of investigation and a range of sanctions. The public appointments regime is hugely developed in comparison to 25 years ago when a tap on the shoulder was the norm. The National Audit Office is scrutinising government coronavirus contracts as we speak. The principles themselves have been consistent since 1995, while practice has been flexible and has changed and developed. In many areas of public life, those seeking to act in breach of the principles of public life will come up against formidable institutional obstacles. Nevertheless, there are reasons for real concern and I'd like to give a few examples. There can be little doubt that the handling of Richard Desmond's proposed scheme to redevelop the West Ferry print works knocked public confidence in the fairness of the planning system. And as far as I'm aware, there has been no independent investigation into conduct concerns that the ministerial code had been breached. The bullying allegations made against the Home Secretary were investigated by the Cabinet Office, but the outcome of that investigation has not been published though completed some months ago. There may be legal and complexities underlying this, but those have not been made clear, and this does not build confidence in the accountability of government. 
And in both cases, it's not, it is not necessarily the outcome of the investigation that's the problem. Rather, it's the fact that the process for dealing with allegations of ministerial impropriety are not transparent and independent, so accountability is limited. In its current state, there's little reason for the public to trust this process and its outcomes. And other parts of our standards regulation are under pressure too, namely our public appointments regime, as the independent public appointments commissioner recently made clear in his evidence to the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Nolan was clear that ministers should retain the final say on who to appoint, but that it was not necessary or desirable to make affiliation a criterion for appointment. It's not unusual or wrong for governments to want to appoint people who share their views and political activity is not a bar, but it should and cannot be a reason for appointment. Merit must be at the heart of the system, not cronyism or patronage. A fair and open appointment process for leaders of organisations and public bodies is necessary for public trust in our institutions and also to attract talented people to these important roles. Public expenditure is back in the spotlight. The suspension of normal procurement rules has exposed the public purse to an unprecedented level of risk. Process-free procurement creates the opportunity for cronyism and distrust. It's no surprise that allegations are rife, that contracts are awarded to those with political ties to the government. These may be unfounded, but without proper process, the public won't know. I'm therefore pleased that the National Audit Office is quite rightly looking at coronavirus uh, procurement. And finally, governments past and present have been too easily tempted to disregard the norms of democratic accountability. Proper scrutiny and debate may be perceived as a hindrance, but our parliamentary processes undoubtedly improve the quality of government decision making and the laws that are passed. The principle of ministerial accountability underpins the legitimacy of office and cannot be substituted for the firing and hiring of senior civil servants. Mounting public disquiet is not without foundation. It's not the role of my committee to investigate alleged breaches of the rules, and I'm not drawing conclusions in any of the cases alluded to in this list, but nor is this list exhaustive. Taken together, these issues lead to some, believe, some to believe that there is a culture of impunity seeping into British governance. It's possible for politicians to say that the judge of whether they have acted appropriately is the electorate. Let them judge, and if they don't like what we've done, they can kick us out. That populist reading of the character of the Constitution and its system of accountability effectively in claims impunity for government actions from anything other than the ballot box. The accountability of ministers to parliament, the regulations governing the use of special advisers, and the clarity about who is taking which decisions on the basis of what judgments about the evidence, adherence to the normal rules of political practice, all that can fall by the wayside in the name of electoral mandate. If that is the world we're in, then we really would be post Nolan. But we should recognise how much of the public, our public life would also have changed. This affects not only those in politics, it remodels the framework within which civil servants and a whole range of other public officials operate and leaves them without grounds for questioning the basis on which decisions are made, policies developed and contracts awarded. A populist reading of government responsibility erodes the independence of the administration and the quality of public service delivery, and often does so intentionally. It makes them wholly subordinate to politics. This is like turning football into a game where the rules are set by the crowd. While the crowd is certainly sometimes right, giving it direct authority over the game and its rules changes the game fundamentally. It also raises questions as to how far the crowd is being manipulated in ways they do not themselves recognize by whom and for what purposes. And it obscures the distinction between those who can make the most noise and the interests of the public at large. So if there are genuine and valid concerns underlying the post-Nolan allegation, what is to be done? 
Maintaining standards in public life, like maintaining standards in business, takes sustained work. Sorry to say that there is no silver bullet, but nor am I shaking my head in despair. An expectation of adherence to high standards of conduct applies in the UK both to public officials and to those in elected office. For public officials, standards of conduct, conduct can be laid down as a condition of employment and thus are more readily enforceable. In this way, the system for officials is analogous to arrangements in the private sector, but it's more complex for those in elected office who owe their position to the democratic choice of the electors. And I suppose I should add that it's even more complex for members of the House of Lords, like me, who are neither employed nor elected, but let's not stray into that particular thicket. It remains the case, however, in politics, public service and business, that ethical standards are first, first, first and foremost a matter of personal responsibility. Everyone, from ministers and chief executives to junior staff and officials, must choose to uphold in their everyday work the ethical values their organisations proclaim. Culture programmes can encourage good practice and regulators can encourage compliance, but ultimately high public standards are a decision for the individual. Few systems are sufficiently robust to constrain those who would deliberately undermine them. The position for the government itself is more problematic. Ministers have a responsibility to abide by the ministerial code, which is partly a guide to standards and partly an instruction manual on cabinet government. The Prime Minister specifically mentions standards in public life in the codes forward, but enforcement of the code lies ultimately with the Prime Minister. This can leave the Prime Minister in an invidious position, faced with the dilemma of how to avoid political damage on the one hand and how to maintain standards of conduct on the other. The Prime Minister has an independent advisor on ministers' interests, but the advisor currently has no independent power to initiate investigations, and even when an investigation is undertaken, no ability to publish the outcome. My committee has previously called for more independence to be afforded to the advisor, and I continue to believe that this may be a necessary step. Current arrangements quite clearly fall short of the normal processes of standards regulation. In no other area, including Parliament, is the investigatory process so limited and politicised. While sanctions must remain in the hands of the Prime Minister, as ministers are exclusively political appointments, there is no reason for the investigatory process to be so. We will be looking at these arrangements as part of our latest review in order to ensure high standards of transparency and accountability. And such a change would also free prime ministers from their current uncomfortable dilemma while still leaving them with the power to take action or not as they judge necessary. There are weaknesses and unfinished business in the standard structures, which is why my committee is keen to hear from business, the public and those who work for the public in our current landscape review standards matters too. The strength of the committee, and probably why it's uh, lasted as a rather strange quirk of the Constitution, is in hearing from all sides on tricky issues, assessing the evidence, and suggesting improvements. The Committee on Standards in Public Life isn't a regulator. We are part of a complex machinery of checks and balances where our role is to monitor the machinery, improve it, and identify areas where it's deficient. But the spate of concerns expressed about adherence to our standards framework and the seven principles of public life should not be ignored. The government's ability to lead the country through the coronavirus will be strengthened rather than undermined by an adherence to high standards. You can't fight a pandemic if people do not trust the government. A clear commitment to honesty, objectivity and accountability and leadership, as outlined in the Nolan Principles, would seem to me to be a good place to start if you want to maintain public trust. There are many reasons to doubt that we are truly post-Nolan. We're not at a point where we have lost trust in nurses, teachers, council officers or benefit staff. We may be cynical about politics, but few people believe their own MP to be corrupt. 
this turbulent and divisive time in our national life and overseas will eventually have to come to an end. Politicians of all colours will need to focus on ways to bring a divided public with them. This will undeniably involve looking for the common ground and common standards. The Nolan principles, far from being a thing of the past, provide the standards and tools we need to find a clear route through. Thank you very much. So Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. I think Hugh Wilkins, when he wrote in the, the questions panel um, that this is a superb lecture, was speaking for us all. Um, and also Hugh asked um, if there would be a, a transcript available and we will certainly be doing uh, our best to work with Lord Evans' office uh, to, uh, to, to, to see how to, uh, to accommodate that. Now, I would encourage you please uh, to post questions um, in the, the question panel. Um, if you can keep them nice and short, because um, it's then much easier to get uh, more questions in. But in the meantime, we did ask or give people the opportunity before this evening's lecture to send in some questions. So if I may, I'd just like to start with a few of, of the questions that we've already had. Um, and we had uh, one question about whether you think there should be an enforcement mechanism um, for the Nolan principles. I mean, I, th I think what you described was a number of, of, of the, the building blocks which, which helped to try and, 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 and give greater uh, effect to them. And you also, I think, Jonathan, identified some of the potential areas where we could strengthen them. But any further thoughts about uh, how or, or whether further enforcement would be appropriate? I think we have to, the Nolan principles, which, you know, which I think are really important, are quite, um, they're quite sort of high level. I wouldn't say they were abstract, but they're pretty high level. Um, and I think whilst they work as a, uh, an overall uh, set of guiding principles for the whole of the public service, to make them work in, uh, in individual institutional organisational contexts, you need to go further and I think you need uh, codes of conduct and uh, you know rules specific to a particular area because trying to trying to sort of enforce um, objectivity or selflessness I think it's very difficult but you may say within a particular context you know in this institution you need to do X and you mustn't do Y so our view is that the principles work as a uh, a sort of lodestone, but they don't work as a rule book. So we think there need to be, you know, interpretations of them for particular institutional contexts, uh, which is why, I mean, you know, House of Lords, House of Commons have codes of conduct. Uh, most organisations have codes of conduct uh, suitable to their particular circumstances. I used to be the head of MI5. Uh, you have to have particular sets of ethical standards and, uh, and procedures for conduct in that environment, which would be very different from the ones that you'd have if you were in local government, for instance. So the the principles are the same, but how they apply needs to be localised, and that's when you can introduce enforcement mechanisms in our view. Thank you very much. Now, I think Jim Bignall follows up on that very nicely by asking whether you think that politicians should actually have to sign a pledge um, to, 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 to the um, Nolan principles. That's an interesting idea. I have to say, it, it, where public standards meets politics, that's the real difficult area, in my view, because there is, you know, I don't, you can't sort of, as it were, call, the, the accountability for politicians is to Parliament. Uh, and whilst it'd be very nice to have a, uh, uh, an expectation that everybody should pledge to up, here, uphold those stat, the principles, um, I think it would be a bit of a dead letter because everyone would say, well, I was, uh, whatever they happen to need to do at any one time. Um, and also there's the question of how do you then enforce it? Because you know, the, the enforcement mechanism for politicians is, there is in part, that's how the accountability mechanisms work. They're not accountable to me or something. Uh, so I, I, it has attractions emotionally. I'm not sure that it would work. And I suppose if somebody stands and said, actually, I don't agree with X, I don't agree with, you know, objectivity, uh, and then got voted in and formed the government, then you'd have to take that, you know, you couldn't say, I'm afraid you, 
you, uh, your election has been nullified because you didn't meet the Nolan principles. Uh, so I think it's slightly idealistic, um, although it has some attractions at an emotional level. Now, Hugh Lee's been asking, perhaps with an eye on the, uh, the news from across uh, the Atlantic these last few days, um, Hugh asks, is there anything equivalent in, in, in the USA or indeed in, in some of the other democracies around the world? The, the prime minister here has talked about creating a, a, a group of the, the democracies globally. Is, is this something that we can have as part of our soft power exports? It's interesting. I don't know the answer to that fully. And I, when I think about it, I think I should know the answer to it. There are definitely uh, some similar committees to mine in some other countries, some surprising countries, actually. Um, but I don't, the, the political arrangements tend to be very much you know, rooted in local circumstance. Um, and so you know, whilst there are undoubtedly common values in terms of rule of law, in terms of um, freedom of speech, etc., which you know, most of our key allies adhere to, I don't think there is a, a sort of overarching set of articulated principles of the Nolan principles type. Um, but it would actually, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. And uh, it's something with which I will plague some of the colleagues at the uh, committee tomorrow and say, who else has got these? Because I, I haven't actually asked myself that question and I should have done so. Thank you for that. I've learned something. <laughs> well, hope, ho hopefully uh, some of our colleagues from, from the, uh, the committee who are watching uh, the webinar will be already taking notes that are oh, <laughs> have some answers already for the chair tomorrow. Um, now, um, Tina Russell just asked um, a two word question. Um, and the two words are, are, are Dominic Cummings question mark. But let me actually add uh, to this and maybe we can broaden it out a little bit. Because one of the questions that we had in from before the webinar um, did pick up the specific uh, uh, reported ambitions of Mr. Cummings uh, to remake the uh, the civil service, and you, uh, Lord Evans, touched on the the recent departure of of, 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 of some mandarins, um, and of course um, the uh, the minister of the cabinet office, um, Michael Goad, gave a very important speech at Ditchley. Um, for the Ditchley Foundation lecture just a, a few weeks ago, which was very much talking about changes to the machinery of, of government and, and, and so on. And what, perhaps maybe to depersonalize and, and, and to talk about the role that special advisors generally play. Um, I think we have my predecessor as chair of the IBE, Edward, Edward Bickham on the call. And Edward, of course, in his time was a very distinguished uh, special um, ad advisor. And we may have other current or former SPADs uh, on as well. Uh, the, the way in which special advisors um, are covered by, by Nolan, is, 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 is that sufficient, do you think? Um, I think, you know, the civil service is, you know, it should not be seen as being a sort of national trust property that you can't make any changes to because it's got to be perfectly preserved, you know, from history. Uh, and it's absolutely right that governments should think about the way that civil service works and try and make it work better in each generation. And, you know, that's, that's to be welcomed. Um, having said which, you know, things such as objectivity and openness and accountability are also built into the relationship between civil service and government uh, and so on. So they, the way in which you structure a set of relationships for governance uh, has impact on the way in which uh, the system works uh, in those sort of principled ways. So you know, we, we do have a degree of check and balance and the civil service you know, with its statutory basis uh, embodies judgments about what is the right way in which we ensure that we get the best possible decision making? So we shouldn't be we shouldn't be unduly respectful of the civil service because you know it's there for a function and it needs to undertake that function. But we need to recognise that that also in you know the way you do it creates uh, a governance model which can either help to underpin things like the Nolan principles or potentially can blur it. So we need to be careful. SPADs, again, absolutely critical part of the system. Uh, I, you know, I know there has been controversy over the role of SPADs and political advisors over the last 20 years, partly because of some uh, 
it's like rather acid characterizations in the media and in you know uh, in fictionalized spads that we all know and love um uh, you know i used to deal with spads obviously in the course of my public service career and it was fine no problems at all very helpful uh because you know translating the political need ambitions and needs of ministers into a deliverable set of goals is a is a very necessary and valuable uh part of the overall system um spads there is a code of conduct for political advisors uh mostly mostly civil servants uh, most most spads are temporary civil servants obviously they don't have to meet the political impartiality um, rules of being a civil servant because that wouldn't make a lot of sense uh, but in other ways they are subject to uh, a code of conduct in the same way that other people in public service um, so it's not all that different in many ways from other civil servants um, and ultimately ministers are responsible for the conduct of their spads uh, and have to answer for it uh, so the same you know the, going back to the you know the Dominic Cummings question uh, I'm, it's not for me to make any judgments on the particular facts of that, except to say that it will be hard to uh, hard to conclude that it was uh, positive in terms of people's confidence in the uh, the lockdown regulations, etc. And from that point of view, a, a price has been paid. But in principle, the Nolan commit the, Mo the Nolan principles apply as much to political advisers as they apply to anybody else. And there is a code of conduct, uh, and we look to ministers to enforce that. Now, you may say, uh, well, what if they don't? Well, that's true, but this is the political side of the, the sort of equation, and you can't, uh, you can't sit in judgment of it uh, outside of the city. You can't have a, you know, an appointed official who oversees all that. Uh, the accountability in, that, in those regards is to Parliament and ultimately the voter. Uh, but as insofar as political spads are employees as well, there is a code of conduct. Thank you. We, we clearly are absolutely in the thick of it in terms of many of these questions um, right now, because we have one from uh, from Charles um, Hownell, I, I hope I pronounced um, your surname correctly, who's asking a question about, given the potential for conflicts of interest, why are MPs allowed to provide um, paid advice to or to have uh, commercial uh, directorships for commercial organizations and so on. So that's, of course, a very, very long-running discussion about effectively should MPs, uh, or indeed members of the House of Lords do, um, have other uh, out, out, outside uh, interests. Um, any any reflections on, on, on that? Yeah, I mean, to put, to, you know, to be, I, I have other outside interests. Uh, I continue, you know, I'm a director of a company, etc. The committee has looked at this a number of times and has, you know, thought about it extensively and has made recommendations. Our, there is, a, there is, a, there are strong arguments, particularly for I think MPs and lords are in, are in slightly different situations. But if you talk about it in regard to MPs, uh, there are quite strong arguments for allowing them to have external interests. Uh, you know, it may be that you don't want a priestly caste of uh, politicians who never are allowed to do anything else. Um, but you know that that's a judgment. I think the, the judgment of the committee is that there are it is not something that is wrong in itself. Where it becomes wrong is either because the MP's functions as an MP are being impacted by the external interest, or there is a lack of transparency, or the amount of time being put into it means that they can't actually undertake their principal role as a member of parliament. So it needs to be. Uh, a reasonable level and there's a judgment to be made as to what that is uh, but the view of the committee has been that it's not something which is wrong in itself um, the situation with lords is slightly different because it's you know it's not as it was necessarily seen as a full-time job and you don't get paid a salary um, and therefore but you the critical issue in both houses is transparency and visibility so that if there is an interest uh you declare it not just in the register of interest but actually in debate so that people can judge what you are saying against you know possible extra motive ulterior motives that you may have to be making it and that's a sort of issue which is regularly pursued uh through the conduct procedures in both houses if uh, declarations are not as thorough as they should be so 
you need actively to manage potential conflicts, but I think it would be, I don't personally feel that it's improper to, uh, to have a variety of different interests. I, I, I personally ab absolutely agree. Um, now, now, Jonathan, I thought um, you made a very, very persuasive argument for why businesses should be concerned about the Nolan principles and the upholding of the, the, the Nolan principles. Um, not, first of all, in terms of, of, of the, the environment in which to do business in the UK, and you made reference to the, the, the Moody's downgrading, but you also argued, I thought, absolutely correctly about the fact that given that so much of, of, of government is now delivered through private sector contractors, and I know we have representatives from uh, at least one uh, major contractor to, to, to government in, in, in a number of different areas uh, on, the, on, on, on the webinar today. But if we can start to also to, to think about some of the other applications now of, of, of your important work in relation to uh, business ethics, um, as, as, as well as to, to, to society ethics. And an important question from Marion um, Oswald about how can the, the Nolan principles be represented in contracts with the private sector? Uh, she raises specifically the question of data analytics, which have obviously been so important during the current uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, 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 and thoughts about anything that, that could be done to strengthen generally the way in which since 2013 Nolan principles um, have been transferred into uh, to, 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 to contracts for, 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 for companies providing government services? Yeah, I think, I think it needs to be clear that if you are delivering public service contracts, that the ethical standards the government apply to it, and that's not always as clear as it might be. Uh, on the, the data issues specifically, we uh, did in fact another rep a report on particularly on artificial intelligence and public standards, uh, which was published earlier in this year. So anybody who's interested in that, and I know Marion will already uh, be close to that, um, will be able to see what our view on it is. But I, my, I think it's, we have to make sure that if government is using uh, data capabilities uh, from the private sector, that the implications in terms of standards have been carefully thought through and discussed. Uh, you can't outsource that risk. It is a responsibility of whoever is commissioning the service to think about what the risks are and to continue to monitor them. And particularly in advanced data analytics, that's something that you need to do with uh, well-informed uh, support. And it's also something where you need to keep revisiting it because particularly with AI, you know, the, the, the benefit of it is that it learns uh, if it's working right. Uh, and therefore, as it learns, it may change the way it does things. Uh, and against that background, you need to keep going back and checking. So you need, I think any, co any contract we are talking about needs to factor in these aspects as well as the straight commercial aspects. Um, and I think this is something which government has learned. I can remember you know, 20 years ago when PFI, you know, Public Finance Initiative, was new, uh, you know, going along to Treasury um, meetings promoting this new idea. And uh, I think we went into it rather naively, imagining that, you know, the be transferred to the gut to the private sector, et cetera, et cetera, and then it would all be great. Um, turned out it wasn't quite as easy as that after all, because the risk keeps coming back to you. Um, so you need to be much more thoughtful about what level of risk you think you can transfer, how much you can't transfer, and that includes ethical risk as well as delivery risk and financial risk and so on. So many of these things, I think, are susceptible to careful risk governance. Um, we're getting slightly off um, standards issues, but uh, you know, well-developed risk governance that really understands the risk it's taking and how this might develop can keep us away from some of the most obvious pitfalls and that applies to ethical risk as much as to anything else. Thank you and of course none of this is in hermetically sealed boxes because every, everything is, is, is reinforcing and so on. I know we have a number of, of colleagues on the webinar evening uh, from different parts of the National Health Service 
and uh, we had a, a, a question uh, in, in relation specifically to the, uh, the 2015 Freedom to Speak Up reviews, um, uh, Speak Up review that confirmed that there was a serious problem of retaliation against uh, NHS staff who speak up. And indeed, there was a, a very good article in the Financial Times, I think, yesterday uh, a, 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 about this too. Um, the review talked about culture change, but NHS staff surveys apparently show very little real change in the culture since 2015. What can be done to make it safe for staff to raise concerns? And, and perhaps we might draw also, because you've had this great experience both in, 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 a, in a very important part of uh, public service, but also having the, the non-exec roles in, in, in HSBC more recently and also with, 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 with KPMG, your, your reflections on building a, a more ethical, responsible culture of which things like Nolan principles can, can be such an important part. Yeah. Um, it might be worth just to say a few words about the way in which we tried to handle this in MI5 um, without sort of breaching any great confidences. Um, intelligence and security work has its risks and it has its ethical risks. And if you look around the world, you will see a, quite a number of you know, security services which are deeply bad organizations. Uh, they are fundamentally you know, unethical and, uh, and abusive. Uh, and that is not the sort of security service that we want in the UK. And we're, we haven't got that sort of security service, I'm pleased to say. Um, but it needs continual attention. And we, give, we gave quite a lot of thought to this. And we had, as you would expect, an external whistleblowing route so that anybody in the service who had a, an ethical or, or other concern could go to an external uh, whistleblowing uh, uh, channel. Um, that seemed to me that's necessary, but it's, it's almost a last resort. What you need, it seemed to us that what you need to do is to, to get these issues out and discussed so that members of the service feel, felt, feel, that if there are ethical dilemmas that they face or they have concerns, that actually they are actively encouraged to talk about them. And certainly my view as the Director General was, and the boss, was that the chances of my spotting an operational, uh, an ethical dilemma in the operations of the service were close to zero because, you know, you're insulated through a private office and, you know, you've got a long way away from what's happening. Um, so we tried to create I think we had some success in it, uh, an environment where people actually felt that it was part of their job was to talk about these things, and that was welcomed and seen as being a positive contribution to the work of the service rather than a criticism of the work of the service. And appointing an, an internal ethics um, uh, sort of champion, if you like, who was a very recently retired, very senior member of the service, um, whose job it was to go out and talk to people about the standards and ethics that the service wanted, to listen to what they had to say. People could go to them, not just to blow the whistle, but actually to say, look, we're, you know, we're thinking of doing X. Uh, how, what are the ethical issues around this? Can we just kick this around? And that seemed to be welcomed, because people do worry about these things. Um, but they ought to feel that the fact that they're worrying about them is a really good thing, because you, know, you want to get it right. Uh, so the more permission you can give to people to talk about these things without feeling that they're pointing to their colleagues or something, the better. Um, and I think that, certainly from my perspective, I think that worked quite well. It was also useful at the management level because um, you got an insight into people's, where people were worried, where the shoe was rubbing, that you wouldn't have got otherwise, uh, anonymously, but, you know, in a kind of sensible way. Um, so I think there are ways of trying to get the, those ethical debates into an organisation. We had a few external speakers come and talk about this, you know, how do you think about ethics and so on, so that it just becomes part of the stuff that you talk about in, in the running of the organisation. Um, and I, I think that's a helpful safeguard. Um, it, you know, you'd have to tailor it to any particular environment. And of course, it's made much more difficult as soon as the law comes into it, because, you know, much as I love lawyers, um, there is, you know, the law is very, can get to a very straight, you know, uh, confrontation 
uh, and then you have to adopt a defensive position and so on. So trying to get in early before there are legal disputes and just get these things talked about to create what we, we talked about as ethical buoyancy within the organisation uh, seemed to us to be a way of trying to head off problems early rather than waiting until something has gone wrong and then having to defend what you've done. Uh, so, you know, I'm not saying it's easy and it's not 100% uh, reliable, but at least you're then getting these issues out and aired and talking, getting people to talk about them uh, so that the people can then owe, feel that they own the, uh, the solutions they get to. And if I can just add one other thing from my experience as a company director, um, I remember talking to the head of HR at a, at a company that I was involved and talking about explicitly some of these issues around, you know, the, what are the, what's implicit in the Nolan principles is this responsible use of entrusted power, which is almost a definition of governance. Um, and, you know, we all have power in a company, everybody, you know, anybody certainly in the management has power, but, you know, we all have some degree of power entrusted to us, but it's entrusted not to us to benefit ourselves, but it's entrusted to us to benefit the organization or the customer or the public. And recognizing that and talking about it, uh, I think is a, an important part of getting the balance right as to how the ethics should work in any particular organization. And presumably that's where, from, from your experience, it's particularly important that leaders talk about some of the ethical dilemmas so that people under, understand that it, it is perfectly reasonable to be asking some some questions about is 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 this right having a speak up culture which is strong enough so that you you're not waiting until something has got really so bad that you're into the whistleblowing yeah. territory yeah i mean the good yeah. the, the good the good outcome of the well the the outcome which i thought was a, a, an indication of some success in the mi5 program was the fact that the external whistleblowing channel went quiet. Um, I remember talking to the, the external whistleblowing person and him saying, I've heard not, virtually nothing from your service this year, so what's going on? And I said, well, I think, you know, this is not because we've suppressed it or cut off the telephone number or anything. Uh, I think you'll find this is because of the fact that there's much more internal discussion on this. And in fact, you know, the internal and external elements were linked together and were able to talk about it. So you know, it should be. It shouldn't get to the point where you need an emergency intervention. Uh, you should be able. You know, public health measures should be probably better than good ambulances in this area. Quite so. Yes. Now, um, questions from uh, Ruth. Ruth Steinholtz, uh, a very good friend uh, of the the institute, um, and Ruth takes us back to uh, some of the the, the the questions in terms of the core part of your your lecture. Uh, given the low levels of trust in government, uh, Ruth writes, and the examples that we all know about and which you, you, you've quoted some for us this evening, in, do you believe that there is an appetite uh, to truly um, tackle the apparent lack of adherence to, to the, the standards? I mean, I, I imagine you must do because otherwise you wouldn't be the chair of the committee. But um, yeah, I'm I'm an, I'm an optimist on the whole on standards issues. Um, it's never perfect, um, but if you look if you look over the last thirty years, we have much better uh, insight into and transparency about things that have been going on. Uh, you know, you would be a completely reckless MP if you thought nowadays you could go and you know, sort of say to a businessman, "Will you give me some money in a brown envelope and I'll ask a question." You know, that would be politically suicidal, uh, but it was happening in the 1990s. Um, and in the same way, you know, you, you would be politically suicidal as, a, as an MP if you thought you were going to fill your expenses, but it was happening in the 2010s, uh, or 20, you know, to the 20, the noughties. Um, so in a number of ways, things have moved on. Is there an appetite to tackle the areas where there are problems? Um, I think quite a lot of this tends to go in jumps. So a particular big issue comes up, there is a feeling it needs to be resolved, uh, and then you have a, so it's a sort of quantum process. It, you know, it's not that there's a little improvement every six months. Quite often, you know, it comes to a head and then there's an improvement. Uh, 
one hopes that you can nevertheless make little changes as you go along to improve things, and that's part of what our committee does all the time. Uh, you know, we did a report last year on local government standards, and that was quite well received. And they are important tweaks, but they're not fundamental. So, you know, you just need to keep pressing and taking the steps where opportunity arises. At the moment, you know, government has a huge amount on its plate. And, you know, we, anybody, you know, any person of goodwill has got to recognise that the government is under acute pressure in all sorts of areas at the moment. It's unlikely that, you know, standards reform is going to be the top of their agenda. Uh, and that's not a, for any sinister reason. It's just that, you know, just getting through each day must be a nightmare. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I think it's important to keep these issues on the agenda and the wider agenda and then to take the step forward when opportunity arises. Thank you. You talked about the the way in which the kind of the some of the the core questions in terms of standards in public life have evolved from when Lord Nolan first set down his his seven principles when it was cash for questions and then as you say the uh, the MPs expenses scandal and I think you said in the 2010s a, a lot of concern around lobbying if you were going to be having the advantage of looking back in 2030 and reflecting on and the really big central set of questions around standards in public life in the UK in the 2020s was dot 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 any any candidates that that you could put on the table for us I suspect there will be I don't think we've quite sorted lobbying really there have been some movement on it but I think most people would not feel that we have fully addressed concerns around lobbying I think the the and it's, it's not quite a standards question but it actually interfaces quite a lot with standards questions is the what I think is becoming now quite well established issues around uh, the power of technology. Um, you know, given the centrality of this in public, in, in all our lives, then how power is used uh, by technology companies, etc., I think is very important. And the other issue, which has been certainly in the high in our in the, the minds of our committee for the last two or three years, are Standards issues were slightly different sort. They're not to do with money. They are to do with behavior. And this is a reflection, I think, of, of, of changing social expectation. So the Me Too movement, concerns about bullying and harassment in uh, Parliament, uh, very acute and serious issues to do with uh, uh, abuse and intimidation of those in public life. And that's not just those in elected office, but also office holders of various sorts, uh, you know, uh, teachers and, and headmasters and headmistresses and head teachers who are, who, who are subject to abuse and threat. Um, and this is a really big problem. It's a different sort of standards issue, but it is a standards issue and it has big implications for who feels that they can get involved in public life, uh, who is willing to be so. Uh, those people, you know, women and people from black and uh, uh, and Asian and minority ethnic communities are more susceptible to much of this abuse and intimidation. And that has a real impact on the character of our public life. Uh, and it's an issue on which our committee made a, uh, made a report, wrote a report uh, two or three years ago, but it's still absolutely live. So those almost behavioural issues, or rather more than financial issues, seem to be the ones that at the moment are concerning people. I, 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 I so agree, and I think the, the question about why do we think that on social media, for instance, we can abuse people in ways that, that you wouldn't expect in, 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 in if, if, if somebody was, was, was face to face, etc. The kind of the trolling that, that, that is occurring, and of course not not even just to people in public life, but also the way that cyberbullying has become such a a, a a major issue for for a lot of young people. And I suppose that that comes back to the to the question about um, identity and how you feel that that you are part of of of, of a something bigger and, and and therefore want to to behave to others as you'd expect them to behave to you the golden golden rule of all the 
the great religions and, and philosophical um, traditions. Now, I'm, I'm I, trying to... Last night, if I can say, the, um, a broadcast by, uh, speech by um, Joe Biden talking about, you know, various things. But what is striking about the way in which he is communicating is his attempt to not to fall into uh, tribal language. Uh, and reaching out across that, you know, the, the divide in America, which is worse than the divides are here, uh, and saying, look, we're all Americans. You know, you may be a Republican, you may be a Democrat. It's one, you know, I am the president for all. And that kind of language, I think, is really important uh, because the more that we feel that we are uh, entrenched tribes uh, surrounded by enemies, the worse for all of us, uh, paradoxically. Um, it's you know it's uh, this is this is the sort of opposite of a, a zero sum game. You know, that if you get into that world, then everybody suffers. I was reading uh, Kim Darish. Lord Lord Darish was uh, the former UK ambassador to to, to Washington's uh, book uh, a few days ago, and and one of the things that, that he p picks out as a way of trying to make sense both of Trump and of of, of Brexit vote and 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 so on is this much greater emphasis on identity and on identity yeah. politics. If we're going to avoid the kind of, of culture wars that we are seeing in the USA, for example, where do you see the, the potential for the Nolan principles particularly to be part of, 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 of pushing back? Well, there are, they do, um... The Nolan principles are absolutely not about alternative facts, as it were, which you know is one of the famous um, Trump um, neologisms. They are about uh, recognizing that there is actually fact out there that you need to take into consideration. There is objectivity, etc. So they are predicated on a you know what I believe to be an absolutely vital, but in some ways slightly less fashionable model of public discourse which shows respect which recognizes a degree of common facts and which uh, tries to reach a conclusion through objectivity openness and uh, and dialogue rather than through assertion and misleading and you know we it's striking the work that was done by the committee before my time on intimidation that uh, there seemed to be a major change in the tone of elections between about 2015 and 2017. And it's hard not to wonder whether the, uh, the way in which people are accessing their news, this, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of bubble problem in social media, etc., actually exacerbates this. And that's not a new perception, but I do feel that the timings are quite striking. Uh, and if you, if you are then falling into that you know, no common facts amongst you between different tribes. It's very difficult then to argue, to argue about what the best route forward is if you can't get to a first premise. And that, of course, puts huge responsibilities back on some of these mediation, social media platforms such as Twitter. I think it's quite interesting in the last few days, the way that they've chosen to become much, much more interventionist in terms yeah. of labeling uh, tweets from uh, President Trump, for example, and some of his supporters as being um, subject to, to, to factual um, debate and, 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 and so on. So it, 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 I think what I'm hearing you say is that this has to be part of a much bigger um, picture so, so that things like Nolan principles are a very important part, but they're also crucial ethical questions also for the private sector as well, particularly those in in, 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 in big tech to, uh, to, to, to be able to um, make, make, make this um, work properly. Um, factual question, are religious institutions subject to Nolan principles? Asks Hugh Lee. Uh, the Nolan principles as, artic you know, they apply to anyone in essentially the public service, widely defined and to anybody delivering public services. So if a, if a religious organization is delivering public services, then I think there would be a legitimate expectation that they should meet the Nolan principles. I think if they are, if they are not, then I don't think that is an, an expectation, although 
one would hope that religious organisations would recognise the Nolan principles as, uh, as desirable. And I suspect that Lord Nolan's thinking may well have been affected by the fact that he was, in, as it happens, a, uh, a committed uh, Catholic and the, the tradition of Catholic social thought uh, sort of feels to be very much in the same space as the Nolan principles um, and, you know, em emphasising the moral responsibility of individuals, etc. So I don't think they are uh, subject to it in some legalistic sense, but uh, one would hope that they would see it as attractive, rather in the same way, interestingly, that the, uh, the royal family, uh, they're not subject to the Nolan principles, uh, but if you look at the, what they say in the, in the, uh, the reports, etc., from the household, they do say that the, this is the approach that we wish to take. So it has, a, it has an attraction to organisations that aren't, as it were, subject to it in some legal sense. Um, and I would say that probably about many companies that I've seen. I mean, one of the things that struck me, you know, anecdotally, is having been, a, having been a completely a public sector person for almost all my working life until I was about 55 and suddenly popped out into, you know, quote, the real world, unquote. I've worked out, you know, a long time ago that there isn't a real world anywhere. Uh, everybody thinks the real world just over there somewhere. Uh, but actually the issues facing leaders in the public sector and issues facing leaders in the private sector are very, very similar. Very little difference. The, the sort of people actually are very similar. The sort of issues that they are tackling are very similar because they're about people and how do you lead people, you know, how do you serve actually in all sorts of ways. These are very common issues and it's, you know, there hasn't, there hasn't been as big a change as I expected moving from uh, public sector to private sector. I, I, I again agree hugely with that idea of the blurring of, of, of the boundaries. A really interesting question from um, Mark, Mark Chambers, um, who of course is one of our colleagues uh, on the IBE team as, as, as one of our associate directors. Mark asks, if you could add an eighth Nolan principle, what would it be? Gosh, that, 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 that's quite a hard one given <clears throat> took the, the original committee quite some time to come up with those seven core core ideas. Um, it's very, funny enough, the committee, we have been talking about this in the committee um, because, you know, from time to time you think, well, I mean, these are not, you know, the, they are very good principles, but they didn't come down from, you know, they weren't handed down on plate, on sort of, uh, on plates of gold or anything. So they're, you know, they're there for a purpose. Um, I, I think it would have probably for me it would be something around this behavioral stuff whether you how you articulate it but in terms of respect or something of that sort because people at the moment the thing that where the, the place where it's rubbing is this bullying harassment me to uh, intimidation so it's that lack of respect it's how you deal with other people as well as the other principles now you know you can argue as to whether it's a good idea to add to it or what but i think something in that area is where the you can stretch the principles as we have inherited them to cover that under the leadership principle or whatever but actually you know if you think about what people are worried and fussed about quite often it comes back to that the way in which people are treated uh, and showing respect for other people and recognizing their autonomy um, and that again it's, it goes back to this question of the appropriate use of power because very often where there is bullying and harassment, this is a, a misuse of power. Uh, and you, certainly in institutions, Me Too and so on, it's a misuse of power. So that applies just as much to uh, the way in which you treat your colleagues and the way in which you treat members of the public as it does uh, the way in which you use your spending power or whatever uh, as a public person in public life. And that, of course, goes right to the heart of what we're about in the Institute of, of Business Ethics, all about how do organisations both create but then also sustain truly ethical cultures that helps to shape all of the, the actions, all the behaviours of, 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 of all of the employees of, a, of, of, of an organisation. A great question from a former IBE colleague, Catherine, Catherine Bradshaw, who 
was a key member of the team for so many years. Catherine asks, what does integrity mean to you, Lord Evans? I think, if you think about what the, what was the meaning of, of integrity, I can't remember the immediate definition of the rubric under the wording, so I'll be in trouble with my colleagues uh, tomorrow. But um, I think integrity is, uh, I mean, integral means, you're, you know, it's all one. Uh, so this is about um, something that I touched on sort of I think in the course of the lecture you know do you do the right thing when you're kind of you know not nobody's looking you know integrity means it, is the whole thing together uh, you know it, it, are you acting with integrity or you know are you acting with different motives in different circumstances so you know there's an element of duplicity there's an element of hypocrisy uh, so lack of integrity means that um, you may say one thing and you do another that seems to me to be how at least how i think about it thank you now i've still got lots of the questions that were sent in earlier and i'm not sure we've, we've managed to capture every question that we had in the the question room but we are virtually out of time now before I hand back to, to my colleague Ian, just, just one last question from my side, if I may, which relates to the question about how do businesses, which are particularly contracting with government, delivering government services and so on, and therefore, as, as we heard, since 2013, uh, required to, 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 to follow the Nolan principles, you, you raise the question about how does selflessness apply in the context of of of, of, of business um personally I, I i think that with a lot of the debates now around um new forms of, of capitalism around stakeholder capitalism uh, around ideas of stewardship that there is getting a much closer alignment than if you take the old milton friedman view that the purpose of business is about maximizing shareholder value. But any final reflections, given we are the Institute of Business Ethics, yeah. back onto to our core activities in terms of how you re you reconcile selflessness and 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 and, and business. Um, I think there has been a real big move away from the this is just about shareholder return. Certainly in the companies I mean I think almost any of the companies that I've had anything to do with, it is not just shareholder return. The, you know, the me meaning, as it were, behind it actually matters. And that's not just because it's a nice thing to do, but actually in terms of the sustainability of a company and license to operate, if you are just seen as a you know, cutthroat basic bunch of profiteers, you know, that's not a great you know, selling point to, you, to the market, I would say, uh, unless you're in certain industries. Um, so you know, there is a there is a you know, there is a different approach, I think, in business. I suspect it's always been there in many businesses, but it, you know, the art, the way in which it's articulated has, has, has changed a bit. It, on the specific issue of selflessness, I will give an advert. Uh, Mark Chambers, who you uh, just mentioned, uh, is submitting a guest blog to uh, our Committee on Standards in Public Life uh, website uh, on this very issue. And Mark and, Mark and I have previously. Uh, talk, talked about this uh, and what does this mean and it's been, so uh, Mark's given this a lot of thought so I will advertise his blog and say if you're interested in this issue Mark will probably articulate it more effectively than I can um, and the, I mean my final comment is that what, one of the jobs that I most one of the things in my roles that I most enjoy is, is that I chair the advisory board for a small social enterprise uh we in uh in poplar in east london and they aim to help society i mean they want to make a profit that's fine they want to you know they want to be a thriving business but their aim is to make society a better place by the people they employ and help to move into the work uh, environment from difficult backgrounds and from the way in which they serve their customers and it's striking that the, the by talk by say by act, the way they act and the way they articulate what they're doing um, has actually attracted clients because they think actually this company is a company that will see me through. They're not going to do anything. With, you know, they they are on my side, 
And you know that that seems to me to be selflessness uh, in the way that the company acts, but re you know rewarded virtue that actually customers find that very attractive. And they if they lose customers on price, they will sometimes get those customers back uh, because they realise that actually that the the service the servant mentality that the company has towards its clients actually means that it's worth paying that extra five or ten percent. So that, that I found fascinating to watch. And undoubtedly, we all benefit from more hybrid business business forms as well, whether it's social enterprises, cooperatives, mutuals, partnerships, and so on. No pressure then on, on Mark to deliver the, the blog in, in, in timely fashion. I'm sure he's going to be working away this evening there to, to polish it uh, some more. And we look forward to, to reading it. And um, Jonathan, thank you so much. You've given us a, 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 a tour de force. You have um, answered every question. You've not uh, tried to um, obfuscate on, on any of them. So I think we have had a super evening um, in the great tradition of the UK uh, lecture. Um, thank everyone who's been ask, asking questions. And I'm going to hand back now finally to Ian to, to do the final wrap up. Ian. And I think this is where I discovered you, the same thing that you need to press your yes, you've done it. Fine. <laughs> I think I think my, of course it's you've given very clear instructions. Um, and uh, what you tend to do is you assume you know better. So you do it your own way and then you you fool the whole system. Anyway, so I should I should listen to what my colleagues tell me. Um, I've learned a lesson there. Anyway, and so just to wrap up, finally, um, uh, before I say thank you. Uh, I just first of all want to remind everybody that the lecture uh, and the whole session will be available uh, on our website uh, very shortly um, and on YouTube. Um, a transcript should also be available, I believe, um, of the speech uh, if anybody wants to uh, read it. Um, and um, please do uh, give us your feedback. Please respond to the survey. It's useful uh, to get your views on how you found uh, the event, uh, what's been good for you and what we could improve on. Um, quickly say there are a number of events and activities coming up before Christmas. Uh, so do look out for them. Uh, we have a Speak Up Masterclass. Uh, we have a session called Pandemic People and Ethics, the other PPE, um, uh, all around how we, how we manage the ethics of managing people. Uh, we're going to be publishing a new business ethics toolkit, particularly aimed at small and medium enterprises. Uh, and also a very important report we'll be publishing on the ethics of diversity. Um, so lots to look forward to um, and lots of things for you to read over Christmas when you've had too much turkey and all the rest. Um, so finally, um, it just remains for me to thank um, uh, Jonathan and David. Uh, David, great job chairing as always. Um, thanks to everybody else for your questions, uh, which I think were absolutely fascinating. I'm going to go away trying to think about what the eighth principle is. I think it's uh, given us all food for thought. The most important thing about these events is that they give us food for thought, uh, I believe, and they give us something to take away. And if I may say so, Jonathan, you've given us a huge amount to take away, huge amount to think about. I think the relevance of the Nolan principles uh, and the, the relationship between what happens in the public sector and what happens in the private sector, uh, you've made very clear uh, for everybody to see. Um, so absolutely fascinating. It's also been a very interesting day um, to see various uh, elements of media coverage, which has only added uh, to the excitement, I think. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.